Then we, uh, we looked at uh, Psalm 19, the grand old hymn of God's creation, showing us that this is our Father's world. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky proclaims the work of His hands. The last week was Psalm 90. So the first two that we looked at, Psalm 139 and Psalm, um, uh, what was it? 19. Yeah, Psalm 139, Psalm 19. Those... Those two are written by David. Last week we looked at Psalm 90. And who wrote Psalm 90? Moses. Moses. Yeah, yeah, Moses. The only one that Moses wrote yeah. uh, of the Psalms. So let's look at Psalm 51. Um, and when you think of Psalm 51, let me just ask this. When, when you think of Psalm 51, what comes to mind? What do you think about Psalm 51? What is Psalm 51 about? Repentance of sin, okay. Who, who wrote it? David. David. What's going on here? Why is David repenting from sin? Bathsheba, yes. Yeah, I, I think of Psalm 51 as David's major blunder. I mean, this was a biggie. This, this was a, a really bad misstep. A, one of those moments that can mark you for life. And, um, and David um, had sinned with Bathsheba, and so I think that probably the best way before we start reading the psalm is just to sort of review what were the events that caused this, this psalm. Well, what, what, was, what do you mean, Keith? What is this thing about David and Bathsheba? Well, um, you can read about it in 1 Samuel chapter 11 at a, at a time when kings, and David is a king, at a time when kings go off to war, David stayed home. This is the first time that he'd done that. He stayed back at his home in his palace, and the kingdom was growing. The army was strong. The, um, man, things were going well. And somebody, I don't know who, I can't remember if it was actually, if it's if they tell us who suggested this, but, but somehow David got the notion, I don't know if it was his own idea, you know, um, I've got generals that I can trust, and I'll send them off to do the grunt work, and I'll just stay here and, and take things easy. And then David was on the rooftop uh, in the evening, and he saw a woman bathing, and he lusted after her, and he wanted her. And he ordered his men to go bring her to him. Turns out she's a married woman. Her name is Bathsheba. And um, David had an affair with her. And then she became pregnant. This, By the way, this is King David. Keep in mind, this is the greatest king in the history of Israel. Um, up until our Lord Jesus Christ, right? I mean, he is like, he's still the most revered, most respected, but this is a major, major blunder. And uh, he, he finds this out that she's pregnant, and instead of doing the honorable thing, he calls her husband, whose name is Uriah, yeah. calls him home from the battlefield, mm -hmm. and sets up this thing where he tries to Honor Uriah. Uriah, you're doing such a great job in battle. Just come home. You've deserved a little R&R. &R. But Uriah is such an honorable man that while his troops are out there battling in war, he refuses to go home and be with his wife because David's trying to cover up his sin, but the Holy Spirit's not allowing it to happen. And I don't know, I don't know Uriah's motivations. I don't know him at all. Scripture doesn't speak of him. I think it's a little different to come home and refuse to be with your wife, but I don't know. He may have been a very, very honorable man. I, I do not know, but I just know that David wanted to, he just hoped it would go away. He was trying to cover this up, but God wouldn't let it happen because he refused to go home and be with his wife. He said, how could I dare do that while my men are out there risking their lives? I won't do it, King David. So then it gets even worse. David says, okay, let's go to plan B. He's, he writes up this edict. He, he gives it to Uriah to get 
Picture that. He hands it to Uriah to hand to the general. And little does Uriah know that it's, a, it's a, an edict about him. Uriah is faithful. He's a messenger, a carrier. He takes this and hands it to his general. And Joab reads it. And, and in the message it says, From David, put Uriah right up at the front line of battle. Ah. Make sure that he gets killed in yeah. battle. Yeah. So, so, um, so that, yeah, it happens so that he gets killed. And uh, so they're sending the messengers back to David to report on how the battle's going. And, and the general says, now if David gets upset, if David gets really angry, just also happen to mention to him, and not only is this tragic that we've lost lives, but... Even Uriah has lost his life in battle. If he's mad because we're getting close enough to the enemy wall and, and they take advantage of us because that's a poor war strategy. And by the way, other Israelites have died the same way. And I know I should know better as a general. But just tell David that his servant Uriah has also been lost in battle. Whew. This is big stuff, isn't it? This is... Major cover-up. Boy, if if CNN could get a hold of this, right? <laughs> if if all of the major news outlets could just, boy, they would love to run this. This is, uh, it's it's sizzles. It's it's everything you want in a news story. There's, there's betrayal. There's there's uh, lust. There's murder. There's all of these things, and it's all trying to be covered up. Until the prophet of God also <clears throat> took the carpet on it. And um, the prophet Nathan comes into David and says, There was this shepherd, and he only had one little lamb. Boy, he loved that lamb. And he guarded that lamb and he protected that lamb. That little lamb meant everything to him. But there's this other mean tyrant shepherd who came in and stole that man's lamb away from him. Now, even though he had a lot of other lambs, he just took it. And David, when he heard this, became outraged. How dare him do that? And the prophet looked at him and said, You are that man. Uh, uh. Wow. Now, okay, maybe not in the same terms, but can you relate to that? I can I've had moments in my walk with the Lord where the Holy Spirit called me on the carpet and said, you are the man. Oh, oh man, I mean, it's, there's nothing worse. I remember one time when I was a Bible college student preparing for ministry, and I ran out of newspapers on my newspaper route. I, read, I worked three jobs. I worked at Farmer Brown's Fried Chicken. I worked at downtown at uh, the Loading Dock at Sears. And I also threw a newspaper route for the Waxahachie Daily Light. And it was 150 miles round trip all around Waxahachie, Texas. And um, the way it worked, I would get my newspapers off the press and I would start rolling as I'm driving with a knee and rolling down the window when it's raining, throwing them out, put had little bags hanging from the, you know, from the rear view mirror, stuff the paper in there and just hope that I never got I mean, that's how they trained me to do it, by the way. I was doing the way they trained me. But all the whole couple of years just thinking, what if a police officer like sees me doing this? But it's out on these old roads through Ovilla, Texas, and Red Oak, Texas, and all these little towns. And so throwing papers, and, and I get to the end of the route. I'm supposed to have 240 papers, but sometimes I didn't have 240 papers. I get to the end. If I've only got 237, I have to drive eight miles into town and eight miles back out, and I've still got to get to my other job, and I'm exhausted. And the, the Sunday paper came out at 10.30 on, on uh, Saturday night, 10.30 p.m. And that was fine if it was on time. I would get home about 2 a.m. and then I'd drive an hour to go to Lake Worth Assembly of God where I was on staff at a church and uh, get there early enough for church to start, um, do worship practice at 8 a.m. Those were crazy days. 
Um, it worked okay. I'd get a couple of hours of sleep unless the paper was late coming out on the print. And then, uh, then it got really interesting. Stephanie would have to like shake me awake and say, oh, we've got to get up and go to church. And, um, but there was one time where I did not deliver papers, and it happened more than once, but it's a few times. And then I, I went to the door, knocked on the door, and I said, sir, you haven't paid your bill. I'm here to collect. And he said, I'll pay my bill as soon as I get my newspapers. <laughs> and this guy, Mr. Man of the Word, Mr. Honorable, said, well, I don't know what happened to those newspapers. Your dog must have ate them or something. But I threw the papers and he just said, okay, I'll give you your money. And I got in my car and I'm driving down the road. And oh my goodness, the conviction of the Holy Spirit got all over me. This was not a little deal. This was a big deal. So Keith, so you're preparing for ministry. And you just lied to that man. Oh God, no, no, no. Holy Spirit, I didn't lie to him. See, now what I did, oh my goodness, I lied to him. I had to turn around and go back, went and knocked on his door, and, and the whole time just begging, please, oh Holy Spirit, please don't require this of me. This is so embarrassing. Sir, I lied to you, and I'm so sorry, and I'm returning your money. And he said to me, you keep your money. I don't care about the papers, but I really value that honesty. Wow. Man, oh man, that's, I learned a powerful lesson. So I, we've all had our times, and I, I know that you hope better for your pastor than that. Hopefully, you know, I mean, that's the only mistake I've ever made, but okay, that would be a lie too, so I, I don't really go there. So let's look at Psalm 51. It starts on verse number one here. It tells us, um, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before you. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Now, let, let me just ask your thoughts on this. Why does David think he only sinned against God? Only you have I sinned against. Against you, verse 4, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. What are, what are your thoughts? Because, I mean, he did not sin only against God. He sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Uriah. Um, he, he sinned against the little baby who, if, if I'm reading the story correctly, the child was judged. And, and horribly, tragically, the child died. And this is, this is even after... David is repenting and he's praying and he's asking God for mercy and for grace and asking, praying and fasting for seven days, hoping the child will live. And there's, I'm not looking for a right answer or a wrong answer. I've got some thoughts, but I'm just, I wonder, what does it speak to you? I think this is how we learn from one another. Um, when it says, against you and you only have a sin, what does that say to you guys? Any thoughts? This is the quietest this group has ever been. <laughs> I know a lot of you have some things you could say and would say. Um, and you can, you can be, feel free to in just a moment. But um, yes, he did sin against Uriah. Yes, he did sin against Matthew. Yes, he did sin against his, his own baby. Um, by extension, you could say, you know, he's the king of Israel. He has, he has sinned against the whole nation of Israel. I mean, he really has. But I, I and I don't think that's really what he's saying here. I don't think it, that he's saying, the only one that I've done wrong against is you, Lord. I think what he's really saying is a very important point for all of us. And that is that we are accountable directly 
yes. to Amen. God. Amen. That He holds us accountable. Yes. That that if we if we get to the end of our lives, and if if we make heaven, it will be because we come under the umbrella of the grace of God. That we've been forgiven and we ask God to cleanse and wash our sins. And um, if we are rebel hearted and we get to the end of our life and God has to say, as much as I wanted you to go to heaven, you have refused my grace, so I will allow you to have what you want and that is, you will have eternity without me. What a horrible, horrible thought by the way. But if that does happen, it will be because we're accountable to God. Now that's not saying that we're not accountable to our brothers and sisters and that's not saying that we don't hurt other people with our actions and with our sins because of course we do. But I think David is saying, if I'm going to get forgiveness, it will come from one place only. Yeah. You only. You are the only wise God, Paul the Apostle says. Um, before we read on, any other any thoughts along those lines? Can we help one another? Yeah. Uh, I always consider sin against God mm -hmm. because it's missing His uh, statutes and commandments. Okay. It's missing the mark with Him. Uh, you transgress against other people. I mean, it may be, you may, you know, stealing may be a, a sin, mm -hmm. but it's transgressing against those people and sinning against God. Well said, Craig. Well said. That That's true. Our sin, God is the only one that, that can say, you have sinned against me. I mean, we hurt one another. We wrong one another. But he's the only one that can forgive your sins. He's the That's only right. one that can forgive us. Well said. Any other thoughts, you guys? But that was great, Craig. That was really great. Yes, Joanne? Yeah, we are accountable to God only. Mm -hmm. And then Holy Spirit tells us that we must make it right with the person that we hurt. Yes, yes. Or that uh, something that we've done that was not in order. Mm -hmm. But going to them first is not what's going to forgive me. Wow. Ultimately. Wow, that's powerful. Um, I can have all these relationships intact, but if this relationship is yes. out of sorts, the whole Amen. thing is thrown off. Amen. You're going to find out too that people sometimes are not going to forgive you. True. Some people will not forgive. I've, I've known people that were, have talked about pain that hurt them so deeply. And just to hear them talking, well, you would have thought it was this week, just two days ago. And then they will say something to the back. Well, when did it happen? About 30, 35 years ago. You're, that's, that's so true. <coughs> was there another hand? Did I see some? Yeah, Dottie? Uh, well, she always always uh, said, I'm sorry, but I don't want to yeah, if you've broken one commandment, you've broken all of them. And that's um, interesting wording there because there is a belief among the Jewish rabbis that unless you keep the whole of the law, and if I remember right, it's 613 commandments, not just, I mean, you have the Ten Commandments, but 613 written, expressed commands of Torah, that you have to keep them all. And if you stumble on any one of them, then you're a sinner. Uh, one of them, this sounds ridiculous, I'm not being silly, one of them is you're not allowed to eat cereal any place except in Jerusalem. So how many of you have ever had a bowl of cereal? <laughs> Did you do so outside of Jerusalem? Okay, you're guilty. We're all guilty. So, but that's a, a really valid point is that sin is, is more than just this one couple or three or four or a dozen or however many. Sin is speaking of being in wrong standing with the Lord. Something has impeded that relationship. Good thoughts, you guys. Reading on, verse 5, Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You, caught, you taught me wisdom in that secret place. 
Clean me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter yes. than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Uh, hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Sorry, I didn't put it up there for you, but you can read it now. Um, interesting. You remember a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about Psalm 139? And, um, and, and we said that God knows us intricately, intimately. He put us together. He knit us together, each of us, in our mother's womb. This, this mirrors uh, Psalm 139. It's, it's, notice it doesn't just go back even to birth. Surely I was sinful at birth. But look at what else it says. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. This goes back to the moment of conception. You desired faithfulness even in the womb. Now, does anyone in the room struggle a little bit with this? I had a nine-month-old son. I won't tell you which one. You can <laughs> maybe figure it out. Did I, I, he was at Grandma's house and had a, had a captive audience. And um, it was Christmas time, or Thanksgiving that year, and all the Howard family's in the living room and uh, it was Zach. Zach went over to mom, Grandma's, my mom, over to Mom's plant, pulled the leaf right off this living plant. And his little cousin, Danessa, thought that's funny. And she snickered. And I said, don't you do that to Grandma's plant. He looked at me. He reached over, grabbed another leaf. And it was on like, you know, Donkey Kong. It was, it, it was... It was a testing moment right then. And I, I said to him, you do not do that again. And I'm hoping like the Dickens that he doesn't do it again, right? But he looks at me. He looks at the plant. He looks at me. Jake! And boy, he got, his, he got himself a good little blessing on the backside that morning. Um, I believe that spankings are ordained of God. I think a lot of parents are scared to spank. I think that you should always tell your child why they're being disciplined. I think it's crucial that you always hug your child afterwards. You love them and you tell them, I love you and that's why I'm doing this to you. But it's important. Now, so Here's a, a question. Um, how does God measure age in eternity? We could talk the rest of the night about this one. We had an interesting conversation recently in our class in the library. We were uh, discussing the book from last quarter, um, Heaven is Real. And we were talking about death and dying. Uh, we had some amazing conversations about... Um, Children dying happens every day in our world. Um, I've, I've been to the funeral of an 11-year-old, a 16-year-old, a 21-year-old, 25-year-old. Um, I've been to the funeral of a 93-year-old, an 89-year-old, an 88-year-old. Um, everything in between. And um, here's, here's just um, uh, interesting interesting thing um, men now think about this humanity we're really the ones who sort of invented this this word it doesn't it's not really a word it doesn't exist but we all know that God is ageless God is the ageless one there is scripture that speaks of him being ageless but you never hear this word ageful. If there's ageless, shouldn't there be ageful? Well, guess what? All of you are ageful. God is ageless. But, but us humans, we're ageful. And, and it's a particular word in, in the Genesis account when you read Jerusalem publication. JPS, Jerusalem Publication Society, that doesn't show up. No, New Jerusalem Bible, possibly. I'm blanking. But one year I, I used um, uh, an English text that
that the Jewish people had translated into English, and there are some particular wordings in it that stand out to me. And one of them is, when it gets to the account of sin entering into the world, God uses a particular word that lest they go sinful to the age. I don't even know what to make about that. I just know that God is ageless. He is eternal. He is spiritual. So what happens when these ageful people leave this life as we know it and are blessed with transformed, transfigured bodies that are somehow like Him? I don't have an answer to that. I don't know, but I just know it's going to be amazing. I try sometimes to think about um, what are your ideas about the age of babies who have died when they're in heaven? We talked about that in our last class. What about children who die young? What about grandparents who die very, very old and very feeble? Um, I don't have answers to that. I'm just curious if any of you have figured it out, please share it with me. I would love to know. But um, I, do, I do think it's interesting that age is the byproduct of sin entering in the world. God is ageless. Humans are ageful. And these bodies will be redeemed. So I don't know what to make of that, um, but I, I, I think that it's fascinating to me that God seems to be above time and space like we talked about last week. In other words, He can be in one moment um, on the mountain of transfiguration with Jesus right there, but at the same time, there's this guy Moses who, has, who lived centuries before, and there's this other guy, Elijah, who has who lived centuries and centuries before. Interestingly, Moses and Elijah both journeyed to mountaintops and have an experience and an encounter with God up on top of the mountain. Yes. And now, here they are flanking Jesus Christ, who is glowing and white, and, and he speaks to uh, his disciples saying, some of you who are here, uh, will not die before you see the glory of God revealed. And Peter, James, and John, they see that up on the mountainside. So anyway, just some thoughts to make you try to stay awake tonight. I don't have answers to all that. But I, I do, but I don't worry about it either. I mean, I don't, I, I do not fear that God who can create heaven and earth and all of the beauty of the universe, I don't think he's up there twiddling his thumbs worried about it. I think he's got a perfect plan that's going to blow us all away. Um, verse 6 is interesting. Um, just look at that again for a moment. Surely I was sinful at birth. Surely from the time my mother conceived to me. Um, I don't believe our salvation is predetermined. There are some people that believe that. Uh, it's called predestination, Calvinism, Reformed theology. In other words, God knows who's going to be saved, and it's already decided the best you can do is try your best to be saved and hope that you're one of the people that He predetermined. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't believe that. We are free will proponents. We believe that the free will enters in and that and uh, just like Romans says, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And yet this is beautiful. God has plans and purposes and a set standard of expectations, even from birth. It, uh, to me, it seems to say he's wired it into us. Like he blessed us with everything we would need, even from the moment of conception. He was, he was articulating that into our lives. Um, okay, so... Let's, let's read on, otherwise we'll get bogged down, we won't finish. What time is it, by the way, help me. And Oh, okay, we're doing all the good. Created me a pure heart, O oh God. I, I like this. Um, created me a clean heart. We've, we've sung that song so many times. Isn't it beautiful that this comes from Psalm 51? Created me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Um, I, I love that. And to me, that is one of the most beautiful worship songs that we have sung. 
And just to know that it comes from one of the lowest points of David's life. I mean, he must have felt like, I, I'm so low I, couldn't, I could play handball against the curb. That's how low he is. And yet, this amazing, beautiful prayer comes out of it. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. He's the God of the second chance. Aren't you glad? Amen. How many of you need a second chance? I, mean, I thank the Lord. He's the God of the millionth chance with me. He, he is always loving, always faithful. And if I sincerely ask for forgiveness, He, he washes, He cleanses, He it's as if it never happened before. He does not need to uh, have me retrace my steps to find where I got off. And, oh, now I'm back to the beginning. At square one, I can start again. No, he, he looks at my life and, and all of the mess-ups and the goof-ups and the blunders. And he says, yeah, that's bad. But guess what? I can use that for my glory. And here's the thing. We must never um, make light of sin as though, oh, it's just a little thing. God will forgive it. He doesn't care. He's the God of grace after all. Yes, He's the God of grace. But it, it would be an abomination for us to just make what Dietrich Bonhoeffer referred to as cheap grace out of God's grace. To just make it cheap. God, I can sin at, at nauseam. I can, I, I can sin at will because God's going to forgive me anyway. Did you know that the Apostle Paul used the strongest possible language against that? He, he said, so what do we do? Do we sin so that grace may abound? He says, anathema. <coughs> Forgive my language. Paul said, be damned if you believe that way. That's how strongly he felt about it. Anathema. It's a curse. You cannot you cannot, you must not approach it that way. It, we must be very, very serious about sin. The, to try to uproot it and get rid of it in our lives. And yet, we can never be good enough. And yet, it is only by the grace of God that we're saved. And yet, probably all of us in this room have sinned today and maybe we weren't even aware of it. Some of us, we sin today and we were aware of it. It is only by God's grace that we are saved. He is the God of the second chance. And, and then he says, then I will teach transgressors your way. Um, I will pass it on. I will share this good news with others. Isn't that what God always, always says? That's what He always brings it to. He, he always redeems us, and then He says, now, teach others. Share your story. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them what good things God has done in your life. And then if, if you read on uh, verse 14, deliver me from the, blood, uh, from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God, my Savior. And my tongue will sing of your righteousness, Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. There's, to me, I think, a, a really particular prayer that David prayed here, asking that God would forgive him of blood guiltiness, of shedding blood. Um, do you think there's something different, special, different category about bloodshed? Uh, and I am asking, but I, I do. I, I think that to shed blood, um, you know, is is probably the closest, the most offensive thing that we could do. To 
to take another's life. And that's um, that's really tragic. David, David was guilty of bloodshed. I mean, he set Uriah up. He murdered him. He wasn't the one that threw the spear or hurled the rock or whatever, but he is the one who caused it. But now think about this. David had killed many men in war. That's why he was king. He was an excellent warrior. Um, when the price of the of the king's daughter was to take the lives of a hundred men, why well, he, he did even more than that. He did two hundred. Um, so this psalm, ironically, this psalm is one of the best Bible verses that there is in support of just war. Because David was a man of war. David had shed blood. And yet he's not saying to God, forgive me for those times. I, I had, um, when we pastored in Colorado, there was a wonderful uh, set of twins, two boys, Caleb and Coulter. Um, they were just really sharp kids. They um, they, they went through ROTC, and, and uh, last I heard, they were going to the military academy and with plans to study in Colorado Springs. And um, one of them came up to me after a Sunday morning church uh, service, and he was a senior in high school, and he's planning to go, you know, the next year into a military career. He said, Pastor, I, I really, I've been troubled by something. The Bible says, Thou shalt not kill. Am I wrong to be going into the military? <clears throat> and this is what I told him. And you, I mean, this is just for what it's worth. This is me. This is my opinion. But I firmly believe it. And I think it's rooted in Scripture. That war is not a sin if, if one takes someone's life in the line of duty. Any more than if a police officer in the line of duty is forced to take a life. This is, that's not murder. That's not the same category. Not at all. When, when one nation is battling against another nation, there are ideals and um, principles and, and there is the backing of a nation. And it's unfortunate when people die. Anytime. But when someone dies in an act of war, that's not nearly the same thing. And, and I think this verse says that David knew that. And here's a guy who's a mighty general, a mighty warrior, and he says, Lord, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. He doesn't say it about all of the times that he went off to war and killed people. In fact, he came back from war and the timbrel and dance and the girls are parading and singing and they're, they're saying, Saul has killed his thousand. Saul has killed his thousands. And David has killed his tens of thousands. And they're rejoicing and celebrating and David doesn't stop them. What does David do? David dances before the Lord in worship, celebrating that the Lord had brought victory. Um, but, having said that, there is something different about shedding blood. When the first killing happened, God said to Cain about his brother Abel, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And I remember a horrible story that happened in Houston, Texas, a drive-by shooting and a lady whose son was killed and his blood was in the streets and they had marked off the crime scene and they had done all of their data entry and all the picture taking and everything and they were ready to open the street back up and the sergeant was turning to look and about to tell him to take down the barricades and here was the mother of that son with a towel in the street mopping up the last little bit of her son's blood. And she would not let them open that street until his blood was cleaned off of the street. I, that, I, there's something special and different about, about bloodshed. Pastor? Yeah. Yes. Um, 
on, on the thing there on guilt, we all know when we've done things and we have felt that guilt. Yeah. Guilt will not leave you alone. Guilt will not let you sleep. And if David would have been guilty of all of the other men that he had killed, then that guilt would have ate him up a long, long oh, time ago. Yeah. That's right. And and so I believe when when that guilt hit David, it was centered on one thing only. Yeah. yeah. And it was I, that I innocent agree. blood that he shed. Sam, thank you for sharing that. That's really insightful. Yeah, and because God does have his way of dealing with us. And I think a lot of times it is like uh, I, I've known people who could who could sin just horribly and just lay their head on the pillow, drop off to sleep, seem like nothing bothered them. But godly people, when you lay on that pillow at night and you're kind of rethinking the day, oh no. You I mean the Lord has his way. He will not, just like he said, he will not let you be at peace. So that's that's really good. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, any other thoughts before we read this last section of scripture here? Anybody else? Okay, uh, 16 and down to 19, it says, You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contr contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Hands off to President Trump today for naming Jerusalem yes. the capital of Israel. Yes. That took yes. guts. Yes. And um, that, to, that is... Again, one of those things that makes me think we could be very close to the end of time. Israel, one tiny little swath of land, 150 miles north to south, 50 miles across, surrounded by five giant nations who have hated her and tried to destroy her, but she keeps being blessed by God. And God told Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And so praise God yes, amen. that president, and I do not agree amen. with amen. President Trump on everything, but thank God for, for a president that will honor Israel. Yes. And that is, that's wonderful. Um, so, I, yeah, verse 19, then you, then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous and burn offerings offered whole, then bulls will be altered uh, uh, will be offered on your altar. So what is it that God really desires? I think that's really the question to close with here tonight. God, uh, David says, God, you don't desire a sacrifice. I could get some ram or a, a lamb and slaughter it or, or bring two turtle doves and, and some grain offering. I, I, I've got a whole hillside full of cattle. I'd give them all to you. Would that do it? No. It's got to be something more than that. So he says, verse 17, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. And a contrite heart. Contrite heart. Years ago, um, Al Reaver was a wonderful Bible teacher. We were on staff with Al um, for several years. Al is Dave Reaver's brother. If you've heard the Renowned evangelist Dave Reaver, just amazing man who's blessed our world, really. And Al is, um, I suppose, even today, I don't know this for a fact, but he's always been connected. At that time, he was the general manager of Al Reaver's, Al Reaver, uh, uh, Dave Reaver ministry. And then he was also the pastor at our church. And um, I heard a fascinating Fascinating man, uh, graduated summa cum laude from Rice University in Romantic languages, spoke multiple languages, had mastered Spanish, Italian, and um, Latin, and um, and, it, and he would share these things, and, and he shared this one, and I've never forgotten it, and I've shared it lots of times, but he's the one that I heard say, 
that uh, my sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. The word picture here of that brokenness is like a, um, like a pharmacist taking the medicine into the bowl and grinding it with the pestle. Until it's a powder. Just grinding it until it's just broken. How many of you have ever been under the Lord's pestle? I have. It's not fun. It's not enjoyable to be broken. There's many times I'd say, I'd rather not. But, but when we are broke, there is something about brokenness. That's what God really desires. Not to stay broken, but for us to admit, oh God, I'm just a mess. Unless you forgive and sustain and strengthen and lead and guide, my life is just a wreck without you. I think God really desires that. I know um, we, we could talk a lot more. I've gone long and I'm sorry we're out of time. Does anybody have any parting shots or any, uh, uh, any consolation gifts for us before we go? Any, yes, yes. Yeah. On, on the sacrifice there, on, on the uh, 17th, he comes down there and uh, uh, let's see, contrite heart and broken spirit, mm -hmm. you will not despise. If we live in that area of our life constantly, yeah. because the sacrifices of animals was for sin. Yeah. And we will find ourselves not having to sacrifice animals for sin because sin won't exist in our lives if we keep that relationship oh, open with God. Praise God. Good stuff. Yeah. Amen. That is His desire. He wants us to walk in unbroken fellowship with Him without anything impeding, without any obstacles in the way. And uh, I've, I've said this before, but... I think this is an accurate way to, to think of the Christian and sin. Whereas before I was saved, I clung to sin. But now, after salvation, I find that sin tries to cling to me. And I need to dust it off and, and pull it off, pull the stickers off. and Those barnacles that try to attach themselves. But that's the difference because now I'm not clinging to sin. I'm clinging to God. I'm clinging to Him. Joanne, yes. Uh, one of the things that I do at nighttime, right before I go night night, I mean, while I'm there, mm -hmm. ready to uh, in the bed, I quote the scripture: "You were wounded for my transgressions, mm -hmm. and you were bruised for my iniquity, and the chastisement of my peace was laid upon you, and by your stripes I am healed. Mm -hmm. I receive yes. your forgiveness for this whole day. I receive forgiveness, and I receive." Your peace, and by your stripes, I am healed. It's beautiful. By the way, that is a Hebrew model of serving the Lord, and actually, that comes from the very from the Psalms. From the very Psalms, the idea is that the nighttime is the beginning of the day, followed by the sunshine in the morning. Yes. How much better to go to bed? clean, forgiven, Amen. having restored your soul to the Lord, resting through the night, and then awakening to a day ready to face whatever adventure God has for you. Yes. Thank you for sharing, Joanne. Um, well, let's have a volunteer who could close us with prayer. Anyone that would like to close us with prayer tonight? Anybody at all? If you don't, I will. Okay. All right, Ben. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word and we thank you for your blessings and thank you for the insight that we saw tonight that you gave us and thank you for Pastor Keith and all the wisdom you give him, Lord. We ask your blessings upon each person here and, and their family members and, and uh, friends, Lord. And we, we love you and praise you and thank you for this time of year. And we, uh, we ask that you forgive us of our sins and let us search our hearts yes. and let clean clean give us a pure thank clean you. heart lord for you we love you and praise you now and and thank, thank you, you jesus. in jesus mighty name
Amen. Amen. Forgive me. One more prayer that I forgot to pray earlier. We should have. But uh, I, Lord, I pray for Pastor John's friends, um, Terry, and um, and I do not remember his name, but but uh, she's pregnant, and and the the little baby is uh, its organs are growing on the outside of its body. And the doctors are telling them that she should abort this child. And she loves you. And she believes in you. And, and values um, children in the womb. So I am asking you get the courage and the hope. And I pray for a miracle for this baby that, that you have knit together in its mother's womb. Even like we prayed, we read about tonight. We are praying right now that you would know this child and fashion it after your image and do a miracle of healing. Oh God, uh, Psalm 51 says you desire faithfulness even from the moment of conception. So we're praying for extreme trust and confidence and faithfulness. We're asking for miracles for this little baby of healing and restoration in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Pastor, she is actually due the end of this month. Oh, wow. name is Selena. Okay. And I got a card from Terry today. And she's due on December 31st. Oh, wow. Well, wow. so that get, I just, all of us that will, let's remember to pray for baby Selena then, yeah. between now and the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. My first son was born like that. Wow. Philip, his, everything was his stomach was closed, but everything grew on the outside. Oh, my goodness. And it was burnt, and it was knots, and it was totally damaged. And what they did is when he was born, they opened him up and set everything inside and gave him a couple of weeks to get strength. And with a lot of prayer, mm -hmm. when they opened him up, all the knots were gone, the bruises were gone, the burntness were gone. All they had to do is sew the pieces together. Right. Wow. And the only thing he doesn't have is a belly button now. Wow. Marcia, thank you. That gives us the encouragement to pray and believe. Thank you for sharing that. Well, Lord bless all of you. Have a wonderful evening.